major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, December 17th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabolsi. A viral trend on the social media site TikTok threatening school violence has put parents, students, and school officials on edge in San Diego County and across the country. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado says no specific threat has materialized in San Diego, but school officials and law enforcement are on alert. On Friday, school districts and law enforcement across San Diego County were monitoring viral social media posts warning of violence at schools. The vague threats originated on TikTok and spread across all social media platforms. Officials say thus far, they found none that are credible. And there was a lot of buzz that there was some sort of nationwide TikTok trend or challenge that was encouraging uh, threats or, um, you know, violence against schools, but there was never any specific or directed threat that surfaced. Poway Unified School District Chief Communications Officer Christine Puck says they collaborated with other school districts when they heard about the threats, but because they were unspecific, ultimately this wasn't enough to cancel classes, but that doesn't mean they dismissed them altogether. Targeted messages were sent to parents from schools where the rumors were rampant. Hey, we're aware of something going on. It's a nationwide thing, but there are no threats to our schools. Although the San Diego Police Department has found no credible threats, officers still conducted extra patrols around schools out of an abundance of caution. And that's how every school district in the county handled it, with caution and vigilance. Dr. Lamont Jackson, the interim superintendent of San Diego Unified, said their district is also offering mental health support to students who've already been dealing with a lot. As adults, we have to know social media is out there, and so we have to recognize it. Uh, lean into it, listen to our students, uh, have them as, as uh, partners in this conversation to uh, how we meet those, their needs during these times of threat and, uh, and social media posts. But it, frankly, it's just sad. Families with children at these Poway Unified schools had the threats on their minds. It's tragic. It's tragic that our kids have to go to school with fear. It's, it's, not, it's not fair. Um, I don't know why they post things like that. It's scary and there's nothing you can really do about it anymore because social media is so overpowering, but not to go to school and like stay home. TikTok confirmed in social media posts it had not identified any specific threats and is working with law enforcement. The company also says it's removing the alarmist warnings that violate its misinformation policy. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. San Diego Unified students tonight are enjoying the start of winter break. Classes ended today on a fall semester that faced more COVID concerns and a continued search for a permanent superintendent. KPBS education reporter MG Perez says there was also a celebration and special take-home COVID tests for students. This ribbon-cutting celebration at Rolando Park Elementary celebrates a new park space in a community that hasn't had one. San Diego Unified School District partnered with the city of San Diego to turn this into this. A couple of acres of renovated and revitalized natural grass fields, walking tracks, and space anyone in the neighborhood can use. Fifth grader Maximiliano Perez Garcia is ready. It's going to be very fun in both school hours and after school hours. It's going to be fun just to be able to run around and play. 
The celebration is tempered with the reminder that COVID-19 is still a threat. Come January, these students will continue wearing masks and are encouraged to be fully vaccinated. Eligible students 16 and up are mandated to be. Winter break means the potential for much more exposure being around family and friends. Stay safe. Get your vaccinations done. Get your booster. Put your mask on. Students are getting help with safety. The California Department of Health has provided COVID antigen rapid home tests for families to get results in just 15 minutes. In the box is a swab, a test card, a test tube. The state provided 98,000 home tests this week for students to use over the holidays before returning to school. There are instructions and a helpline to get the job done, with one test to be taken on New Year's Eve and a second test to be done January 3rd, the first day back. The more that people can test, the better. Knowledge is power. And so they really want to get at-home tests into the hands of families and students. San Diego Unified is one of the districts fortunate enough to get tests for all of their students. The tests are voluntary, but school officials ask that parents report if their child tests positive for COVID. Many of these students went home with the antigen tests this afternoon. Maximiliano is one of them. I'm excited about that too because, well, I want to stay safe and I want my family to stay safe. It's good. It's protecting my family, my friends. Ten-year-old Maria Baldovinos was clear on her opinion too, but really, she told us her priority is the puppy she wants for Christmas. What kind of dog? Uh, a corgi. A corgi? You have a name for it? Lightning. And with that, winter break begins with hope for happiness and good health. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. San Diego State University is telling some of its students that they'll need to get boosted if they're not already. COVID-19 booster shots will be required for anyone who lives in the residence halls or is a student athlete. The football team is one example of COVID exposure this season. It caused more than a dozen players to miss a recent game. SDSU says it will provide gift cards and other prizes to those who update their vaccine record by January 18th. The city of Oceanside is joining a couple of other local cities in refusing to enforce the state indoor mask mandate. El Cajon and Coronado have done so, and now Oceanside Council Member Christopher Rodriguez says they simply don't have the manpower to do it unless the state provides it. I reached out to my city manager uh, and the city attorney of Oceanside, as well as the police chief, and I asked them if they would be enforcing the statewide mandate on wearing masks indoors on our private businesses, and the answer was no. Oceanside's website states the mandate will apply to all their facilities and those who enter them. Mayor Esther Sanchez told our media partner KGTV it's the policy of her city to allow the county to do the enforcement, but she says she hopes people will mask up. The San Diego Police Department is on track to spend more than $7 million on overtime than they were authorized to in this year's budget. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the department's explanation doesn't quite add up. Last April, when Mayor Todd Gloria announced his first budget since taking office, he highlighted proposed cuts to the police department's overtime budget, citing it as evidence he was not handing the police a blank check. And he said the cuts were realistic. I've worked closely with our police chief to make sure that this is a reasonable cut, one that will not uh, harm public safety or officer safety, uh, and then is actually practical and implementable. Um, my responsibility as mayor to manage uh, the organization, to hold department directors accountable for delivering on their budgets. But by working with the police department in advance of making this budget proposal, I'm confident that we can hit these marks and we'll manage to make sure that that's the case. Fast forward to the end of September, only three months into the fiscal year, and SDPD had already begun to blow past its overtime budget. The police department says they've had to spend more on overtime than anticipated because of a 20 percent increase in calls for service. But when pressed for details in a city council committee meeting last month, Police Chief David Nislight gave numbers that showed the year-over-year -year increase was not 20 percent, but less than 5 percent. The two-year increase was about 18 percent. 
Kiara O'Laughlin of the progressive think tank Center on Policy Initiatives says that's suspicious. It seems to us that SDPD manipulates data by overspending the budget and then finding a statistic or anecdote that justifies that overspending and there's a real kind of lack of transparency. Mayor Todd Gloria says he still thinks the overspending on overtime is necessary to keep San Diego safe. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Homelessness isn't just in the city of San Diego. Other communities are grappling with how to house the unsheltered and the county is stepping in to help. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman says more outreach teams are being deployed across the region. You guys doing okay? I got some hand sanitizer, hygiene kits. Yeah, you want one? In Pacific Beach, homeless outreach workers from the nonprofit People Assisting the Homeless or PATH are walking their normal route. We got some food, we got some gloves, we got some hygiene Thank kits. You know, gloves, yeah? Food. Okay, here, here's a bag of food. Today, they're joined by County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher, who helped secure funding to add an additional 20 outreach workers countywide. You've been housed at all recently? I haven't been housed never here. No? And what you see on the streets every day requires us all to do things we haven't done before. Uh, and our county government hasn't invested enough and been as proactive, but that's changing. I know this is a good county, but when it comes to the homeless, People need help. Fletcher says outreach workers are just one piece. There also needs to be places for people to go once they're ready. We need more permanent supportive housing, long-term placements for folks. Um, and then we're going to need shelters as kind of that bridge, that interim step. The beauty of permanent supportive housing, it comes with supportive services. Right. Um, there just aren't enough of them. Agreed. <laughs> County-funded outreach teams will be going to the north, central, east, and south regions with the largest numbers working in the east county. We expect the outreach to look a lot, a lot like what we're doing here. Brian Gruters is the associate director of outreach for PATH. He says the work is especially important in areas that don't have shelters because that's where many people connect with services. And just like we saw in PB, teams can also connect people with employment. Okay, you need a job. Let's figure out how to get you a job. Let me call somebody who can get you a job. Um, and then once we do that, we're going to take them to apply for the job. And then after that, we're going to take them out and buy them a vest and a hard hat and shoes and a hammer so that he can go do the job. And then when all that's done and we know that he's got a job, then we're going to try to connect him to a place that he can afford to stay. Yeah, if you see me around, my name's Corey. Let me know. And I, I usually have things, so. PATH still needs to fill some of these county-funded outreach positions and are welcoming applications. The key is that you're good and, uh, at talking to people and you have a heart for helping people get inside. Sounds like you need to get your ID. EMI. Yeah, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make that happen, but I'd be happy to help you. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Maybe we can meet up tomorrow, I can get a car, and we can, you know, try to figure something out. This week, the Navy outlined its case against the sailor accused of setting fire to the USS Bonham Richard in 2020. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh says the hearings showed how difficult it can be to prove arson. Seaman apprentice Ryan Sawyer Mays was in court for the first time this week. Charged with arson and hazarding a vessel in the fire that destroyed the USS Bonham Richard in July 2020. No one saw the fire break out in the lower vehicle hold, shown here in older photographs. The hold was crammed with boxes, hoses, and construction equipment as the ship finished its maintenance cycle. Two sailors made it to the bottom of the ramp, but smoke and heat drove them back. Defense experts poked holes in the investigators' conclusion that it was arson, saying they couldn't rule out lithium-ion batteries or a spark from inside the forklift parked in the bay where the fire broke out. It is one of the tougher uh, crimes to prove, and it, it does have a, uh, a relatively low clearance rate. Uh, according to the FBI Uniform Crime Reports. So. Robert Shaw is a former fire investigator with ATF who now works with Gulf Coast Fire in Florida. Sometimes you can prove it's arson, but you can't prove who did it. Sometimes you can't prove it's arson, so you never get to who did it. So there are a lot of complicating factors in uh, arson cases that are not uh, associated with other crimes. Naval Criminal Investigative Service interviewed Mays for more than nine hours on August 20th, 2020, before taking him into custody. Mays lied about details of his time in SEAL basic training. He said that the Navy sucked, but he never admitted to setting the fire. A military police officer testified that as Mays learned that he was being taken into custody, a dejected Mays said, I guess I did it. But even she wasn't sure whether he was serious. He has continued to maintain his innocence with regard to these allegations. 
Gary Bartell is Mays' civilian attorney. He spoke briefly at the end of the three days of hearings. Prosecutors portrayed Mays as hating the Navy. Well, obviously, his attitude has changed now, given the allegations that have been made against him. But he's always been, his intent was always to return back to Buds and, and be a SEAL. The Navy painted Mays as upset about being sent to a ship after he voluntarily left training to be a SEAL called Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL at Coronado. Buds is famously difficult with a high failure rate. Anyone who doesn't make it is sent to the regular Navy. It's actually a problem, says Lawrence Brennan, a former naval officer and a law professor at Fordham University. They, they go back to his days when he was in Buds, when he wanted to be a SEAL. And, you know, it, it's a problem when you have a smart person who is frustrated and goes from the world where he thinks he's going to be a SEAL and all the things that entails in reality as well as in his vision, and then gets sent to a ship where he or she is given a cruddy job. The Navy declared the USS Bonhomer Shard a total loss after the fire burned for more than four days in San Diego. Though no one died, it was still a very public failure for the Navy. There is pressure to find out who is responsible, says outside arson investigator Robert Shaw. I would say yes. I would say the higher the profile of the case, the more pressure there is on the government to have accountability. Um, so here you've lost a you know a multi-billion dollar vessel. The hearing officer will likely take several weeks to review the testimony and reports before recommending to the admiral in charge of the third fleet whether Mays should face court-martial. The legal standard is probable cause, which is not an overly high bar. If it goes to trial, the burden to prove that it was arson will be higher. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. There will be some blustery times into tonight as we talk about some of that northeast breeze coming in, especially for the mountains. But overall, then, we're leading into a pretty quiet stretch of weather with chilly nights ahead. A lot of us hanging out in the 30s through the overnight hours. But uh, that dry weather continues into next week. It won't be the middle of next week. It won't be until, rather, the middle of next week when we see our next chance for rain. So here we are in San Diego, 43 for that low as we head through tonight. Not overly cold here, but you can see many places are going to get into the 30s. 35 in Oceanside potential there. Uh, meanwhile, as you look your way to Ramona, 31, Mount Laguna, 33. So there definitely is some chill out there, and that dry, cool air does stick around throughout the region as we head through your Saturday. And that's why we are talking about still some sunshine. So the day's not feeling all that bad. It's going to be more that the nights we notice that impact. 65 the high for tomorrow. Head towards Escondido. We're coming in at 66. And for many locations, holding on to the 60s, like Borrego Springs, 65 for your high. As we get into Sunday, again, bright, seasonable, feeling good. It's just those evenings that are going to be a little bit cold into the morning hours. Temperatures, again, for the coast, possibly making it down into the 30s here for the next couple of nights, but the daytime hours lower to mid 60s. Plenty of sunshine out there until we get into next week. Then we'll start to see the clouds come in, but even then we're largely dry until Wednesday. That's our next chance of rain, including for our inland communities. Notice those numbers though, until then, still in the 30s when we have those clear skies, so it does get chilly overnight. Uh, daytime highs, though, still pushing the 40s for mountain locations as we move through time, though. We'll add the clouds and maybe start to see that chance of some showers work in by Wednesday, although it will be a little harder for some of the mountains and deserts to get that moisture throughout Wednesday as it will just be moving in from the Pacific. So that's going to be our next ch rain chance that we're watching. For KPBS News, I'm AccuWeather Meteorologist Melissa Constanzer. In a rather surprising vote last week, Jen Campbell was ousted from her role as San Diego City Council president after just one year. KPBS Speak City Heights reporter Jacob Ayer spoke with her successor, Sean Elo Rivera, as he settles into his new position. A community plan update is a major accomplishment. After just more than one year on the San Diego City Council, Sean Elo Rivera is now the body's new leader as council president. He says the new role has been a bit crazy during his first week in the position, but he's excited and already thinking toward the future. I see us as, as having the potential of being a really strong council that is transparent to the community, that's collaborative with one another, and, and makes the 
makes well-informed, responsible decisions that leads to the improvement of, of San Diegans' lives. Hilo Rivera is a progressive who has taken on controversial political issues. That includes attempting to modify rules for accessory dwelling units, commonly known as ADUs or granny flats. Accessory dwelling units are an important way to create um, relatively affordable, uh, sustainable housing for folks. Uh, we also know that there is there can be some uh, unintended consequences, and we want to make sure that we're uh, being mindful of, of those as policies are put into place. Hilo Rivera, who represents District 9, says his priority will remain to the communities in his district, including City Heights, Kensington, Talmadge, College Area, and parts of Southeast San Diego. First and foremost, my job is to represent District 9. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, so this uh, this role as council president um, does not distract me from knowing that that's where my focus needs to be. In addition to his city council presidency, Elo Rivera also announced he will serve with Mayor Todd Gloria on the board of San Diego Association of Governments, the county's regional planning agency. Jake Bear, KPBS News. There's a chance we might pay a bit extra for credit card bills mortgage and other kinds of debt. SDSU's Mira Kopik tells us why interest rates are likely going up next year in the Friday Business Report. The Fed announced this week that they're going to cut back on their bond purchases probably by the end of March and potentially raise interest rates three times in 2022. There's a lot of implications there. And the reason they're doing this is uh, Jerome Powell, the, the Fed chair, you know, really said, you know, the economy is healing, you know, low unemployment rate at 4.2%, um, robust GDP growth expected in this fourth quarter, weekly unemployment numbers, unemployment claims are at a historical low and consumers are spending. Interest rates right now, they're almost, you know, 0% from zero to one quarter of 1%. And the Fed believes that by the end of 2023, rates might be as high as about 2%. And where it's going to affect us is in the interest rate we pay for car loans, for mortgages, for our credit cards. And, and so we're going to see in 2022, those rates start to increase. Do you like Bond? James Bond? If so, you'll probably like this next report from KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando on James Bond the musical at the Coronado Playhouse this weekend. Oh, forgot my gun. Meet Bond. James Bond. No, wait, that's Stewart. Tom Stewart. Yeah, I go by both. Actor Tom Stewart has been channeling James Bond since 2018 when he did One Man Bond for the San Diego International Fringe Festival. The end of One Man Bond. James Bond will return in. The man with the golden figure, I am gone. The one with the twice had a spy look and now the license to kill on his majesty's secret service. <laughs> Daylights. It started as a show that was as, as basic as could be, that, you know, I could literally take anywhere and do. So because of that it's always been extremely flexible and adaptable to you know to take to theaters and say uh, I you know I have I have this show and we can make it as big or as you want or as small as you want and the joy of this show is always kind of reinventing it each time based on the place that you're performing now he's revamped the show for the cabaret style of Coronado Playhouse and created James Bond the musical but Stewart's not interested in those iconic Bond theme songs I on the other hand <laughs> I'm very interested in this kind of shadow world of Bond music, which is the Bond themes that were submitted to the producers but rejected. The golden eye is a place where the night is so cold. Or the songs that were specifically recorded as background. To never really be heard, so I wanted to bring all that to light because the show has always been a kind of alternative, skewed perspective on the Bond films. Skewed and sometimes skewering of the franchise he loves. I wanted to have a, a kind of musical version of the film Spectre and that's what we've done here, specifically a William Shatner spoken word version of the movie. But I'm Bond! But not Bond enough to carry the film. But Stewart is plenty Bond enough to carry his show, as he channels all six of the actors who've played James Bond, starting with Sean Connery. 
I'm glad the man henceforth known as Q put all those things in my luggage. <laughs> Sean's here. He's all here. A Russian woman's obsessed with me, Em. Is she mental? So, yeah, it, it's just it's a fi about finding that, that one physical tick. There's a piece of the face that they use more than others. With Roger Moore, it's the eyebrows. Bam! I shot Scaramanga by fooling him into thinking I was a man. When I was played by George Lazenby, I actually was. For me, Daniel Craig is always is always this kind of stance. I am being James Bond. I only try to be accurate with with some of the Bond actors. The uh, the others, I just do terrible national caricatures. Struth, I can see Deanna Rigg through me telescope. But it's funnier just to go for a full on uh, crocodile Dundee. I'm definitely not James Bond because I'm wearing glasses. Now I'm off to Switzerland to have sex with more beautiful women than have ever been assembled in the franchise while wearing a kilt just to piss off Sean Connery. Stewart's done intense research to find not only obscure musical tidbits, but also fascinating behind the scenes trivia about the Bond movies. So whether you're a casual consumer of 007 or a diehard fan, there's something for everyone. Well, Em, I think the writers are trying to reassure the audience that even though they've changed the actor playing Bond from Sean Connery to George Lazenby, the film still exists in the same story world. According to my projections, it's all filmgoers are going to care about by 2021. Oh, Q, you and your nerd words. As a longtime Bond fan, I put my nerdy seal of approval on this hilarious and surprisingly informative summation of all things 007. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.